Hey everybody, welcome to the program today. For those of you who have registered for the Total Scoring Mastery Seminar, thanks for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you this summer. The Total Scoring Mastery Seminar consists of a worldwide uh, viewing option and a local attendance uh, next to Universal Studios. Uh, go take a look at the uh, website at events.filmscoring.academy. Today I'm joined on my left with Dallas Crane. Hey guys. And Steven Stratbear. Hey everybody. And Kyle Juhas. Hey guys. And we're going to talk about scoring. Yes. This is episode 14. Wow. Nice. Yes. Wow, very nice. Wow. We got the 15 coming up there next week then. Special anniversary. Is that right? Why? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's a nice round number. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know? 1500 <laughs> coming soon. <laughs> we'll throw a couple zeros on the end of it. <laughs> uh, yes. So we have a question from Marcelo Trevino of the Film Scoring Academy. He asks If you had to group or already do string effects tracks into different folders for a DAW template, which would they be without them getting too subgroupy? So now he's putting a limitation on how we can answer. Mm. But let's, I don't know, just give some advice on like how to group your string FX tracks. I'd probably just do by duration um, legato versus staccato. So the legato could be holds, trills, you know, harmonic glisses, um, you know, uh, any kind of like one shot triggers that kind of lasts for a while. And then the, the staccato patch would be. You know, hits maybe uh, like chucks behind the fingerboard or um, you know stuff like that. So just by the actual duration of attack, can you sustain it and modify it, or is it just like a one hit? That's how I would do it. Yeah, so and also the limitation. way I have it in my uh, template is kind of by library when it comes to that stuff. So you know, you just tend to know like the Peter Silicek, you know, glissando <laughs> extended technique effects are here, and the um, you know all the various ones, the Spitfires are there. And uh, you tend to just remember kind of like what they're offering you and uh, you know like, okay, I know where to go for that. You just, as you get used to your libraries, you just know which one to switch to. And so you just kind of clump them all together into kind of an end. You know, on my template, I'm doing like an end section of the strings, which is just like all the effects and extended techniques and whatnot. Unless it's like part really part and parcel of a particular library. Like in the case of LAS, LA Scoring Strings, a lot of their effects are also divided up by the kind of sectionalization that they do with the violins and the violas and the cellos and the basses and the different stand groups. In that case, then you might keep those with those so that they would come, but you might want to send those down to different subgroup audio paths so that for bouncing and mixing, you can get them Kind of separated into the proper. Yeah, you, you want to keep the uh, the unpitched strings separate from the pitched strings. I think, you know, if you have some melody, you don't want any bleed from, you know, any kind of rustling noise underneath. So yeah, definitely keep them separate. Oh yeah, unpitched versus pitched. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's how you do percussion. So maybe that works for the strings too. Yeah, perfect example. Yeah, and uh, Emmanuel Vasquez Cortez says. Um, Hey, hello, hello everyone. I need some advice and would love to hear your opinions. What's a good saxophone and or brass library for big band composition? Mm. You know, with fall-offs, high-pitched saxophone growls, all that classic big band arrangement stuff. Thanks mm. in advance. Cool. Um, actually, I was at Taxi and there was a, like a little presentation for a saxophone um, it's the Eric Marienthal Library. And if you guys know Eric Marienthal, he's from wow. the Big Fat Band. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember who was presenting it, but basically, you know, you would get like a clarinet and then an alto and then a tenor and a berry. And you can double the alto and the tenor to get your full five saxophones set up. And I think you can actually, um, you can do some tricks too. You know, you can pitch shift uh, the samples down so that the second tenor sounds a little different from the first. And then, you know, from there you get all the different scoops. I think that's probably a pretty strong library. It's pretty recent, so I assume it would be one of the better ones. I'm um, look, yeah, I'm yeah, looking look now. On Eric the, Marienthal. Yeah, to see what the name of that is. I'm having trouble finding that. But, yeah, if somebody can go ahead and um, search for that and post it in the link below, that would be awesome. Yeah, I, I spent like 20 minutes playing around with it, and it was great. It's pretty phenomenal. Yeah, you have like... 
it, it's it's interesting you have like l levels of um, articulation so you have like your primary triggers and then you got um, other ones that will modify it so you could have you know different kinds of staccato different kinds of legato um, and then all the different falls and scoops and bends and mm -hmm. all that stuff's really great and easy easy to play yeah and then there's this swam library which is uh, I forget who makes that but swam w s I mean s w a m and uh, with that you can do all those kinds of big band effects and I think Garretton at this point kind of has an okay you know big band library just because they have a lot of articulations and especially if you're just if you're a big band composer and writer that can be really awesome because Garretton kind of like is an add-on for finale if you're using finale to do um, your notation I'm not sure if they make a Garretton uh, plugin for uh, Sibelius Hmm. But I'm sure there are I'm some. Sure. Big Bend is, is a huge is a huge market for people who use notation programs. Yeah. They could check out um, Tom Kubis' videos because he, he is a very well-known uh, jazz big band arranger and he has a lot of synthesized versions of his songs. Hmm. And, you know, obviously his robo band um, has to be sampled so you could listen to what he does and if you like what he does. You know, maybe you can figure out what he's using. Mm -hmm. But that's, you know, at least one person I can think of right now who's using samples in a big band way. And the name again was? Tom Kubis. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, awesome. cool. Awesome uh, West Coast guy. So, Steve, you had something you wanted to do? Yeah, about? so I've been thinking a little bit about this um, idea. Um, sort of the future of film scoring, um, I kind of see it as, at some point, maybe who knows 10 years from now or so I see it kind of merging with the games in a way so the two will no longer be because right now you have sort of games and then you have movies but I see them kind of merging into one and I think it's kind of it'll be interesting to see how that how that plays out you know with the the, the score will be I mean the score like a, will almost a game and a movie yeah, and it'll a all game be and a movie together. it'll all kind of be one it'll I guess yeah the it might be like, you know, I mean, you could be, it's like kind of like, it's a mix between a game and a movie. You'll be in the movie, oh. you know, be you'll be yeah. taking part in the movie, you'll be watching it in 360 or something oh, like yeah. that, you know, and, and I'm sure the approach will s alter slightly too. I yeah. Mean, well, think know. about this, when you're playing a game, you know, you push the start button, you can go to the options menu, and you can choose, you know, like the different volume of like sound effects and music mm. and stuff. Can you imagine in the future if... It goes beyond that, and you say, "Okay, this music isn't working for me. Can it be a little darker? Or can no. maybe it's too scary? Can you scale back on the music a bit? Or let's have some fun. Let's make this whole movie. Let's score it with uh, comedy, and then the uh, the machine will do its programming and its you know its uh, calculations, mm -hmm. and it'll spit out a new score for you that's better suited for your film. You know, mm -hmm. so it's a personalized film scoring experience with the help of AI. Yeah, that, that, that could be that, cool. That could definitely happen." It touches ground what we mentioned even before having like interactive uh, not for games obviously but interactive scores or if you're like in the theater and you can kind of can choose say before the theater you know this mm -hmm. the film star <laughs> during yeah I don't want this to go into this direction you just have a little app mm. on your phone and you can just select kind of and see how it goes and everyone you know depending on how many people vote for a certain thing for the next movement that's what gets placed <laughs> right. in there you know and I had I had the idea and Steve and I were talking about this mm. a couple weeks back we were talking about VR and all that that Perhaps movies are going in the direction. See, like, you know, we're right on the cusp of um, Facebook Oculus releasing the Quest. And the Quest allows you to walk around a room um, physically. Um, so you might want to, like, empty your room and just have your walls, you know. And uh, then you can walk around a real virtual reality room. And you can set up bounds so that when you walk out of those bounds and you get, like, let's say near a wall, uh, suddenly your head goes through the that sort of virtual barrier and now you can see the wall in your room. Oh, I see what you said, okay. And then you can go back into VR so you, you keep yourself limited or whatever. So I think, you know, and that's coming out basically in a month. Wow. So I mean, this is very high tech. At the consumer level, it's only 399 bucks. Really? Wow. And it's totally wireless. You can bring it anywhere in the world. You don't need a computer. There's no tethering, you know, it's all self-contained. So, so clearly, you know, this is going to be, it's mainstream, you know, it's just about mainstream, millions of users, and uh, clearly it's going in this direction, right. and I can imagine that, you know, what with, um, what was the Netflix show, it starts with a B, Bandersnatch. Bandersnatch, you know, the popularity of Bandersnatch and sort of choose your own movie, 
I can imagine in VR, you could have a story that really just has characters and certain through lines and every character is responsible for certain things and mm -hmm. that's it. And then they just keep it loose and open and drop you into like all the entire environment. And you know, you, you can plug in to whichever character is available whenever you plug <laughs> in. You know, and you're like, all right, today I'm going to be, you know, a, a wild dog, you know, whatever. <laughs> Whatever's available to me, you know, you have to play a character in a movie. And actually movies on a 2D plane are just going to become like something that you actually participate in, like really. Like you'll be, you know, doing the dialogue, you'll be talking with, you know, everyone else and yeah. interacting. Oh, with. Yeah. I think I can foresee that coming, you know, where a movie is actually... It's a story, it's an adventure that you all take together right. in the hundreds, if not thousands, you know, if not, who, who knows how far it goes. So how, how to score that? Well, that's a real tough one. <laughs> Where's the music coming from now? I mean, right, right. that's just going to make it sound, seem more fake, it would, you would think, you know. So that's a real tough one. That's going to be kind of like forced. the beginnings of a new, you know, a whole new form of art, just like when cinema started and they have no idea how to apply music to it. And then here we are again. It's just going to reset, and you have no idea. You know, in the beginning of of film music, like in the tens, twenties, thirties, it was classical composers coming in as into to become film composers. So it was always way overwritten. It was just like a, like a very musical heavy, very music heavy. They didn't really understand that the music wasn't that important, that the narrative was important, that the storytelling was important, and that the the messages you're conveying from So they did that in a very lush and beautiful way and created you know concert work worthy film scores, you know. Right. But over time that got more and more distilled. You know, even Henry Mancini got distilled down to like its more purest form with like Lalo Schifrin. You can hear the difference between a jazz score from Henry Mancini, which is very melody and harmony and big band dependent, versus like Lalo Schifrin, who like just brings it down to a bass line. Doom 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 boom 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 you know, that's you know, Henry Mancini wouldn't be caught dead with something like that, you know, but it just went. It just goes to show that Lalo understood the evolution. You know that that it's not about the music. It's about the it's the mood. It's the groove. It's the message. It's the expression. It's the narrative. It's the story. You know, and so I think there is this like composers were in the totally wrong place in the beginning of cinema, and now we've gotten to this place where like we can do amazing sound design and put out scores like Gravity. Or you know, be playing with synthesizers and do stranger things, or it mm -hmm. follows. And that's nothing like classical composers would provide, you know. So, but this might happen again, you know. Like all these composers at the top of their game, all of a sudden they're going to be stumbling over the fact that you know they don't even know how to approach this next medium that might be coming. So, right. yeah. What right. if it's like it's not even sound you hear anymore? It becomes you know like bone resonance things or something, you know, or some kind of. Well, control um, where exactly. you're emo you're manipulating people with a subtext emotionally, but it's no longer the medium of music that's doing it. Well, right? you know, you're Elon Musk is working on um, an externally interfacing uh, like brain interface. So you just it sort of like communicates like you just said, sort of like via the back of your your spine. Or it'll probably change as he <laughs> does more research on it. But that's the mm -hmm. current proposal, um, so that you can like connect with the internet at speeds that are far beyond what your eyes mouth or ears could typically perceive you know mm -hmm. so over the next five or ten years this stuff could get really really crazy and what we do with it could get really really crazy and and music might be just a, might not even be uh, as important anymore we better be prepared for that yeah and also I see these some of these movies like even Bandersnatch when I saw it I found my. I was. I looked at the the clock, and in like four hours had passed, and so in that way, the movies could be much longer. Maybe you're in there for a week. You're in this thing, this adventure going on oh, yeah. for. I mean, who knows? I mean, at that the point. days of our lives <laughs> on TV for like sixty years. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's no longer two hours, an hour and a half, yeah, and the idea. movies, you know. Yeah, like binge watching, is kind of bringing back that long form. Art because now it's not like a TV series right. where each episode comes out week by week, you know, and they have to hold the suspense till next week. It's they just drop it all at once and you watch all the way through. So now it's a segmented 
longer narrative rather than a bunch of smaller individual episodes. Yeah, I totally get what you mean. I agree with you that, like, for instance, I'm way into Cobra Kai, the new series that kicks off and reboots kind of the Karate Kid. And, you know, there was 10 or 12 episodes. And then once it was over, it's just like, oh, man, I, I can't wait another year for this. But mm. wouldn't it be awesome if Cobra Kai was an endless experience <laughs> that you could go in and you could be doing the karate and uh, you could be one of the characters. And, you know, in order to further the story, everyone's uh, relying on you creating a particular, you know, you're responsible for a particular event to occur. Uh, and so you have to instigate that. Maybe you've got to, like, be a... You know, kind of bad guy at uh, something, you know, and, <laughs> and instigate a situation, you know, and maybe you don't want to do that, so you jump into another character, and then somebody jumps in and they do it, you know, uh, whatnot. It'll probably auto balance itself out, but I think that, you know, that I, if I could think of that, somebody else has thought of mm -hmm. that, somebody's already thought of it before, mm -hmm. it's probably already, you know, being mapped out, you know, Jeff Bezos, for instance, works, you know, five to seven years into the future, you know, he's not, he's not working on what consumers are currently seeing on Amazon and and the products that are available there now you know he's probably already got a virtual reality shopping mall that everyone goes to and or even further along you know that we products and and and, and experiences that we're not experiencing yet but you know these guys they already know it's coming and the right move the correct move to be competitive in the marketplace is to be ahead of the trend and you know to be able to compete on whatever that next trend is right. and then the next trend and maybe you can see how far ahead you can get you know well, I, could, I could see with like TV series adopting some of the technology from games as far as um, procedural generation uh -huh. where you know like Minecraft you go into a world and you you know you enter a seat or whatever but the the world itself is different every time it's you know it's randomly evolving and so you know, there's there have been some games where you know you get different smaller microcosms of narrative that are um, designed randomly by this procedural generation. Um, sometimes effectively, sometimes not. And then I could see it if the technology gets advanced enough that you watch a TV show and then at the end it says, "Do you want to keep watching?" And then it'll procedurally generate another mm. episode of TV for oh, you. Oh, I to see watch. what you mean. Oh, wow. So that you mean you're talking about the storytelling Jeez. itself? Yeah, uh. could be. Artificially yeah, because what, what you what you use you enter the parameters of the character and the parameters of the environment, you know, and the narrative and maybe the messages and whatever that translates into code, and then it figures out iterations of that that are consistent with your wow. concept. It oh. just made me think of a world like in the future that is just so advanced technologically like that that even like a three year old kid could create a Steven Spielberg movie just by pushing a few buttons and inputting a few mm -hmm. parameters and that basically like we're all just get to enjoy all of this a lot more you know don't have to wait like a year for Cobra Kai to come out again right. I could be playing Cobra Kai every night you know <laughs> <laughs> right. then obviously the uh, after the novelty wears off the real narrative would come through is how people manipulate the AI to create these convoluted, you know, Meta. wonky stories. Meta narratives. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's always what it is. For sure. I think it's going to be, uh, I don't know if you guys, it's kind of unrelated, but it will, I promise I'll, I'll bring it back, but if you guys saw the trailer for the new Sonic movie that came out, and the backlash that they got for Sonic's design, it was so bad, the creators actually came, it was Paramount, and they were like, you know what, we heard you guys, we're going to go back, we're actually going to change this design. It's already completed, like the movie's wow. done, and they have to now go back and redo this, this whole you know his whole 3D imaging, uh -huh. and uh, I, I can't, I'm starting to kind of think now with virtual reality becoming, you know, with Facebook releasing that Oculus, are we going to get to a point now to where it's going to be completely normal for you know movie companies, you know, production companies to release different versions of soundtracks for people, and say you're in your VR headset and then you get to kind of get the full experience. And you get to well, here's the first one. You get to hear and kind of get like samples and tastes of it. Oh, I like that. And they're pretty uh, much taking yeah. polls now is to see like okay, this is the direction, this is the direction we're going into now. Maybe yeah. People are responding uh, to this. Let's do this kind of soundtrack now. So I just had a really like cool idea. Well, they do video game mods like that. Oh, where it's like a different like and you can well, well like you know like Skyrim people mod in like Thomas the Train. Oh, stuff. I see. What you're saying. But yeah, it, okay. obviously, I could see a, the company itself saying like, oh, well, people may want to play Skyrim, but as something else. Right. Okay. okay. And then so you could do the same thing with the music. Same thing. Just kind We're of kind of talking about crowdsourcing. Right. Yeah. Future entertainment. 
Mm-hmm. And it made me think that maybe that's the way score could go too, that we could have right. like a pit orchestra that consists of just like everyone out there who wants to plug in, you know, and join in the band for the day, you know. Uh-huh. And it sort of like follows you through the game <laughs> through the oh, game and wow. everyone's just improvising to everything, you know. Right, right. It's like, it's it's almost, it's like, like you guitar mentioned. hero, but it's yeah. Yeah, film scoring orchestra. Yeah, yeah. But You'd have to just somehow have market. a talent screening method or something. Uh-huh. You know? <laughs> it's like a procedurally generated soundtrack in a way, uh-huh. you know, where it's, uh-huh. You're getting people crowdsourced. You know, it's not, yeah, it's obviously not AI created, but it's still a it's right. A there could actually there could be a creator who provides you with like the different themes and the different right. harmonies and different things you got to go on, and everybody just sort of follows that. Or then a leader that's maybe like constructing it on the fly with you. You know, mm-hmm. I can see that. I could see that. Maybe in twenty five years, right? <laughs> maybe twenty. What I think would be what you mentioned with Elon Musk and creating that brainstem mm-hmm. kind of thing and in, in, like incorporating that into a. VR type studio situation where you're you're literally in your VR studio, which you have your own your wh- wh- whatever it would be would become like having a digital like an actual mixing board, a virtual mixing board, and having you know computers or your synths all like stacked up. <laughs> but then just going so far as to have that technology to where it's like okay, I'm hearing a certain tone in my head for the guitar here. And then it literally takes your actual thoughts mm. and creates oh. the sound from there to what you're hearing. You know? Instead of sitting <laughs> yeah. there for hours being like tweaking this, take yeah. that out, you know. Mm-hmm. Now it just takes that sound and gives you the oh what you're God. literally hearing in your head. Yeah. There you go, you know. And then you can manipulate yeah. that how you would like to. But I, I think it's I think we kind of are coming to that sort of th- aspect too. I don't you think know? any. But I don't think anyone in like. Well, maybe I was gonna say anyone in like 1800 thought, hey, I want a personal train. You know? Oh yeah, okay. And they're like, yeah. and then eventually, like, no one really predicts that next thing. We're just, it's coming though, man. It's coming ferociously. Yes. Like this, this technology is 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 actually changing at a double exponential it, rate, according to Kurzweil. You know, two x squared, because uh, there's multiple disciplines combining and feeding now. back into each other. So it's more than just exponential growth. Did and, you guys hear? Uh, no, I don't. Because yeah. uh, I just wanted to add this really quickly. They're able to translate thoughts into images now. Yeah, I don't know if you knew that. I didn't. Yeah. That was yeah. a bother. I've seen some because my three. my dad used to that. get this New Scientist magazine or whatever. Uh, uh-huh. uh, no, it was some Popular scientific ma- But that or, y- mm-hmm. it was it was maybe even more whatever you call it, more uh, like industry geared or whatever. Okay. But uh but yeah, that was maybe five, six years ago that they yeah. were able to do that. Yeah, I've like, seen some of in that. In the brain and then Well I've also seen some things like where this. they've they've had asked Google to sort of dream. Have you seen those? The mm. dream images? Yeah, yeah. There's like little Deep dogs that are all pink and <laughs> it's just ah, it's awesome. yeah, yeah, it's you know really wow. this is the, this is what what we're, what we're talking about, what I mean when the multidisciplinary merging that's going on, you know. I mean, I can imagine, you know, in this adventure land movie, whatever it is, that, you know, you can have its own physics, you know, you can walk yeah. on ceilings and you can mm-hmm. traverse the universe faster speed of the light. I, you know, all kinds of things. Go Ant Man, you know, you could become Ant Man, right, Quantum right. Man. <laughs> no spoilers. <laughs> but, uh, you know, so the same thing applies to the film music. You know, I really am not sure what's coming, but it could yeah. be, it could be phenomenal. How about like a. One thousand piece orchestra or a ten thousand piece right. orchestra. Yeah. Why not just click clone? You know, <laughs> and just create these yeah duplicate sort of massive orchestrations, these massive symphonies. Yeah. For me, I'm always curious as to kind of how like we always talk about you know coming up with the first AI uh, sort of kind of being that will actually be able to think for itself. You know, do all this kind of thing. We've already kind of created it, its own right, but really kind of creating a, a new sort of in a way a new kind of life form. But then seeing, I've, I'm always interested to see how they, how those things would kind of create their own musical compositions or songs, and are they going to do things that we never would have thought of? Mm. But they are still musical. They all still fit within the same kind of bounds with these, just these new sort of completely new sort of techniques or styles that kind of come out of it. Like that's kind of what you I'm can you can see, literally you know? go to my YouTube channel, and uh, I posted a collection of uh, of AI, Google AI created piano works, and. Was it very musical? Was it still kind of like robotic in its own way? um, I would just say that, uh, you know, if we're not going to have humans create music, does that mean we should limit the technology's creation of the music to humans? Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. The music, I feel, was more advanced than than us. It was like... it It was extremely fast. It was... Hmm. It was very articulate. It had many lines going on at the same time. Oh, wow. um, 
you know, I don't think it's re- I don't think it's our place. It'd be too arrogant to kind of judge it and say, oh, that that sucks, you know. Right, right. Um, actually, you know, I, I say I kind of felt it was beyond the master level, and a lot of people that <laughs> that read that, you know, uh, that I posted that, you know, uh, said that, um, you know, it sounds like crap, you know, but to them, just to us, you know, yeah, to us, you know, good. let's have an open mind here, you know, mm-hmm. uh, for instance, uh, artificial intelligence or technology or computers or robots, machines, uh, they don't have to limit their hearing. They don't have a pink noise curve where their mm. where their hearing drops off at around 20 kilohertz. Right. Their hearing can go up to the megahertz and um, they also can think a lot faster. So like, you know, for instance, like the cameras in a Tesla car run at 120 frames per second or more, it might be 240 every single one of them. So life for it is about eight times slower speed than life for us or faster if you want to call it mm. that in other words like you know you're you go like this you go you move your arm like this but it sees it like this you know very slow right right so um you know it'd be very extremely boring to listen to Ravel or Stravinsky for a machine you know it's like very limited really like low frequency range and extremely slow and boring right. uh, you know not complex harmonically compared to what a machine could imagine you know so I think you know that that level of we've had these discussions before many yeah. times but it, it goes into very creative and interesting places but you know I think you can't we can't really you know imagine how great music can be if it's going to be to the limits of our own understanding. Right. It's basic robots making music for robots is essentially what it is. They're, yeah. they're creating for yeah, their own kind of right. You know? Yeah. And it makes sense that way. It's right. They wouldn't... You and know, it's not really necessarily for lesser species. Like, it's not meant right. for alligators or something. Yeah. So, in a way, you could say that that, you know, A, we might not like it and it might be beyond our understanding, but it might be the next evolution of music. Right, right. So, you know, you shouldn't just dismiss it, you know. You know. It's just, to me, it's, it is. It's just such a... <laughs> it, it, it's kind of like how you said, like we're not used to, we're not used to hearing it. That's quite right? the so conversation to topic. Goes I, I, minutes, you know. Oh, I just want to. No, I mean, I even see like robots even being able to take a piano sound and just morphing it into a violin, just with effortlessly. It's like, oh, of course, they know yeah. the formulas. Oh, yeah, and it just blends into violin, and I mean, it's they're gonna have the power to just if they even care to entertain <laughs> us with our simplistic instruments, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but don't one thing they might them. not be interested in, because um, they don't need to uh, evolve the way we do, sort of genetically in selecting mates and then, uh, based on uh, strengths and weaknesses, and then you know creating you know stronger s- next species and all that. They it, don't need to do that they can evolve digitally mm-hmm. so there's a whole nother method of evolution because of that yeah. uh, they may not have the same link to storytelling or the same need for storytelling that we do because you know we use storytelling to sort of like yeah. they're sort of the parables of life you know what to watch out for and you learn be careful of this situation yeah. You know, don't if you're in the jungle and you're in a jeep, you know, along a cliff, running at full speed. You know, do what Indiana Jones does. You know, because like that, he'll you'll survive. You know, but like, you know, machines may not have a need to to even storytell in order to teach each other how to be better at things. They could fall off the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> they like, don't learn yeah. from our... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They, they might not care to die because, you know, as mm-hmm. long as there's another machine, it's sort of like the Borg, you know, they all can kind of connect. It's the mm-hmm. collective consciousness uh, that we have that we don't have yet. But, you know, Elon Musk may be taking us there with that sort of stemmed internet connection where we can all network together and all of a sudden mm-hmm. become like... A singular mind. Maybe, maybe then we'll be able to solve things like light speed travel just by all combining our minds and networking our minds together. I think uh, the other thing about um, artificial intelligence and music is that we probably don't understand exactly what their interest level is. It could be that they're interested in you know like melody and pitch and stuff, or it could be that they just end up really liking the sound of you know like a Fourth Dynasty Chinese bowl or something. <laughs> right. Right. They'll just hit it. <laughs> you know, once every thousand years, and that's music for them or something. Right, yeah. right. I think so it could be on like like our concepts of blending yes. could be out the window. They could be very patient, very des yeah, disparate and, and mm. garbled and very odd. All right, sense of music. <laughs> <laughs> so getting back to the ground here, Earth. Earth yeah, getting back to Earth. 
Um, and if anybody has any questions they want to ask us about, not about AI, or if you have something interesting to add about AI, AI obviously, apparently, we really love the subject. But uh, somewhat related, Adam Thomas asks the proverbial question, I was wondering what do you consider the best DAW out there? Mm-hmm. Uh, to do film scoring. I mean, it's just like it's so hard of a question to answer, you know. Um, it's you know it depends, um, but you know the three leading DAWs each have kind of different strengths, and they are well. There's really four if you consider Pro Tools kind of a, a DAW, but for film scoring, I think you're probably talking about MIDI ability, and so uh, Pro Tools doesn't have a, a real strong MIDI ability compared to the DAWs to the other leading DAWs. So we're talking about Logic Pro X, Cubase Nuendo. Those are two sort of apps, you know, sort of the Nuendo's like the uh, extra high level version of Cubase. And um, Digital uh, Performer from Mark of the Unicorn. I use Digital Performer's Mark of the Unicorn because it allow, for film scoring, it allows you to have multiple cues up at the same time, including revisions or trailer work. You're doing all up at the same time, so you can have them in different windows and compare themes and really get your score to a masterful level where you've got cues and themes and motifs referencing each other through the entire tapestry of the entire work, plus revisions. And you can see now, if you try to do that in Logic or in Cubase or Nuendo or Pro Tools, uh, you have to switch over to another version and then you don't get to reference the previous version. You can maybe you can copy and paste it in, maybe at the end, and then sort of reference it there. But you can't have three or four or five different sources up in multiple windows and reference them. And that allows you to, to reach like a bit, bit, bit more of like a masterful level. So I would say, I would say if you want to be a film composer and you haven't chosen a DAW yet, I would say choose Digital Performer. Because if you're going to learn something, go ahead and learn that because it's got a couple of kick-ass benefits. Now, if you already are doing film scoring on a DAW, probably just stay with your DAW that you're on. You know, it's going to work pretty powerfully. The, probably the fastest, most, I, mean, I don't want to say most powerful, but it's the most CPU lean and fastest uh, DAW is Logic Pro X. You can get work done and it's so fast. But uh, unlike Digital Performer, um, you know, you can't have all your cues up at the same time. And the same thing goes with Cubase. Cubase, Nuendo, and Logic are pretty much in the same boat. They're pretty fast. They both have very cool benefits for film composers, but digital performers and just a little bit above if you want to hit that masterful level. So if you're starting from zero, just start with digital performer. And, you know, you'll probably get so good at it that you can run and work at the same speed that you would have in Logic anyway. You're gonna, you know, maybe Logic in a couple of years will offer the ability to have multiple cues up at the same time, or Cubase or Nuendo will offer that, and then all of a sudden, um, I'm probably gonna jump ship and I'll <laughs> go back to Logic or Cubase Nuendo. Until then, my scores come out better because I'm able to reference all that material from the different cues uh, and the motifs and the themes. You know, it's a, it's a little bit of, uh, of a master's touch that I'm allowed to do with a digital performer that I can't get out of logic. Yeah, the other thing I I would add, um, this is a little bit of wisdom I got from uh, Adam Rappa, who's a virtuosic trumpet player. Um, And this is talking about trumpet technique, but obviously it's the uh, wisdom is the same regardless of what equipment you're using. Um, You know, he told me as a trumpet player that, you know, he gets a lot of questions about like, when should I get my next trumpet? When should I upgrade? It's like when you're good enough that the only problems in your sound are directly attributed to the instrument, that the only weakness you have is the instrument itself, then you can upgrade. Oh, and dude, so that is so good. good. Answer, yeah. <laughs> Very good answer. Paid him a lot of money for that. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it makes sense. You that know, is like sage. If, if you're asking what is the best DAW, um, I think the uh, in order to ask that question, you should be at your best level and if you're not then you should be working on whatever DAW you can get your hands on improving yourself and then when you start feeling the confines of that DAW and the pressure and you feel like you need to expand and that's the only thing holding you back is the DAW then go get yourself another DAW. Right and that's why I can say before you begin that you that that's going to happen someday with Logic and Cubase Nuendo but it won't with DP. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. <laughs> that's 
<laughs> it's funny because some people they yeah, I see it in terms of plugins like everybody wants to get 50,000 plugins <laughs> it's just like use one and use it to the max and if you have yeah, to then kind of work your way out from there yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. yeah depending on what your specialization is or what you like to do or what programs you use I think it's I think it's just that's you you have it for a reason as a tool you have you should learn as much as you can about it whether it is whether it's an actual DAW uh, whether it's an actual guitar sim program, whether it's a, a synth pro, wh whatever it is, with sound library, it's it's learning everything you can about it, uh, so you never really have that is that issue of being like, how do I do this? You know, it just it just comes down to simply as that. It's just if you have it, then master it. So, and also your DAW won't be here in twenty five years. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So it's always going to keep changing. So, make sure you have a fundamental education on how to do film scoring. Mm -hmm. Not how to like make a da make you make film mm -hmm. music. Right, right. <laughs> the da is your tool, not the other way around. Otherwise, you're the tool. Right. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, and that kind of brings me to our next stub subject that I wanted to talk about, which is if you want to learn about film scoring, if you want to become a film composer, you know, I often get the question, what should I study? What should I, you know, what topics would really get me to learn film scoring you know, it's, and they usually think the answer is going to be you know orchestration and uh, you know topics like that um, but really if you want to learn how to become a composer you learn music and music theory if you want to learn how to become a, a film composer which means game composer TV composer narrative yeah. composer anything for storytelling study literary analysis Go to college, take some courses online in literary analysis. That's basically the study of storytelling. Being able to communicate and become a master of storytelling, that's going to be what makes you a better film composer. <laughs> it has nothing to do with music. It, you know, in order to create good music, learn music theory. But th these are separate kind of arts and separate disciplines. And they don't super relate to each other um, there's you know the creation of concert music and art music and there's the rules for musical form they don't apply to storytelling and if you can't understand storytelling you're not going to be able to story tell and that's really what you're there for about 90% of the time um, score is subtext and about 10% of the time, you actually have to be the main text. You have to be the narrative. You have to be the storyteller. You have to be communicating what needs to be told in that moment. And if you don't know how to do that, you're not going to help the film in those moments. You might be all right during the subtext, during the 90% of the other time. But when the film is weak in the storytelling, that's when you need it to come to the rise to the occasion. And you might not be able to do that. So if you want to become a good, great film composer study literary analysis that's the subject out there that you that you can study that's great yeah it's very true I uh, I remember uh, yeah going through high school thinking you know like oh English classes and all that great but that's a lot of what you reference now in in narrative and literature is you know how to break down the uh, the concept from just its surface level narrative and get back to what it's actually saying and that's important as a cr communicator as a <coughs> excuse me as a creator but also um, just communicating with the director you know if you can speak their language you can get at what they want a lot quicker and so that'll help you in the long run yeah I think it's uh, I mean it goes hand in hand with both I think it's it's true for each you have someone who's on a discipline where it's more audio production or recording you have them with the composer and it's funny because we both kind of lacks sort of the one thing the other one has. And I noticed that a lot in my program. Uh, it was very smart the way they did it. I you know, went to the Mirror program. Uh, it was in St. Petersburg College. I'm going to plug that. It was a great program. Very small, very kind of unknown, but it's, it's going to blow up. But you would they, they forced composers to take our production classes. So they understood signal flow. They understood gain staging. They understood what ascend is. They knew not to, you know plug a whole bunch of effects tracks right on your audio track. They, they understood these, or they tried to push these kind of concepts because it's just that thing where it's, you know, I mean, same thing with a person who's learning uh, just the recording aspects. You still have to understand some sort of theory. You really do have to understand, you know, key changes or tempo changes or it's all these things, but it's like I've, I've noticed that a lot because we'd have a lot of composers in my class and they would just 
you know, they, they would, all their tracks are clipping. They have no idea how to mix <laughs> a certain thing, you know. And I know I really stress that a lot, but it's just kind of, it's something I encounter a lot where it's, you know, it's, we both really do benefit from each other, even though if we, you know, there's kind of a certain, you know, we may think highly of one, you know, and then we look down on the other. It just, it just always depends, but I think it's just one of those things where it's, even if you're just grasping those basics yeah, as a composer, it's, it's very important because, like I said, if you so you do it really big and then you're going to the process where you're sending your tracks in and you left no headroom for your tracks and, mm -hmm. you know, to get it mastered for an actual soundtrack release. and It just it just kind of shows poorly. It just doesn't really show a certain professional quality. So it's one of those things where just kind of like always keep in mind that um, narrative is... That, that creative aspect is obviously your bread and butter, but then going back and just having a certain basic understanding of these fundamental... Yeah, that brings up an interesting point, is I think for most people, they don't know a whole lot about a lot of different subjects. They know a lot about one. Right. And it's actually not that hard to get a wider foundation, you know, to find out, to learn like the 50% fundamentals of some other kind of discipline is not as difficult as it is to learn the last 50% the mastery. Oh, you know, okay. so, you know, composers, like your example, the composers, it's not very hard for them to go and learn like the very basics of mixing and engineering and knowing at least what they should be looking for and you know uh the the different pitfalls yeah. and problems that they could face you know it's not it's not hard for a musician to go out and learn a little bit of graphic design or visual right. you know or even narrative just so that they get a sense gosh there's so many you know m musician things i see that have like no visual sense to them but it's really not hard for them to go out and just even learn about some of the questions they should be asking even if they're not experts just asking the questions they you know they could probably reason out at least 50 percent of it so i think that that's definitely another thing is to be well-rounded you know learn the the widest you know basic level stuff right. you can get always just even just if you're just familiar familiarizing yourself with it just in the very yeah, you're at the very yeah. basic kind of starting point you're still getting into that world now kind yeah. of opening that gate Jonathan Parnham uh, <clears throat> uh, mentioned earlier that um, a good uh, library for big band brass writing is Orchestral Tools Glory Days. Mm. Nice. That's probably like 40s type sound. Yeah. Cool. cool. And uh, familiar with he that. also asks about uh, what is our opinion of Audio Bro's modern scoring brass. And uh, I can say that I've, uh, I've checked it out. Uh, only uh, via their demos online, and uh, verdict still out. Not sure yet. You know, I'm gonna talk with Andrew Krasetsky. He's the uh, founder and developer over at Audio Bro, and we'll see if I can check it out a little bit deeper. Yeah, I only know. Then I'll uh, get you my opinion. LA scoring streams. Yeah, oh, LA scoring streams. Is they're great. Number one, my top, my top uh, recommendation for strings. Uh, the modern scoring brass. From what I heard. Uh, I need to hear more. Um, it looks impressive, but I needed to see how more can I dial it into the way my ears wish for the sound to be. So it, that just depends. Um, you know, there's a lot of libraries out there. You hear the demos, and and sometimes I hear uh, potential in the sound that mm -hmm. maybe others don't. And but I don't hear them pushing that potential in the demo. And so then it just takes uh, either a leap of faith or uh, getting on a system which has it so I can demo it myself in person to see if, in fact, it can go the distance. So so we'll see. The verdict's out on that. Have you guys checked it out? No, I haven't heard that one. Yeah. Out. Now, are you guys, um, when you're using, like, LA scoring strings, are you using other libraries as well to... to uh, Maybe complement other score, other string libraries as well, like maybe th three or four different ones at the same time, or do you prefer to use? Okay, no, I'm just going to use. I this think one. I think LA scoring strings is kind of like the ultimate. Oh, okay. So you might you might use another library to do something not quite as well mm. faster. Oh. Mm -hmm. You know. Yeah. But LA scoring strings basically is sort of like. The polisher, it's the Midas touch, uh, not even the polisher, it's really, if you, if you put the time into it and you really know how to use it well, um, it's, it's unbeatable mm. at the moment. Mm. Uh, so, you know, that thing, yeah. Yeah, the thing about LA scoring strings is it's really slow, because you, if you want the full effect, you've got to do three times. Six takes, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
you have a full violin line, you got to do six individual takes and then three takes of every section. Mm -hmm. So there's violins one, violins two, violas, cellos, and uh, double basses, right? So that's five, and you got to do three takes of each. So that's 15 passes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's, um, it's a legato patch, so you don't get, you know, two notes at a time, you don't get Debussy. So if, Most you know, people want to just, like, play it in... Mm -hmm. yeah, no. with their fingers, multiple yeah. fingers, and say, hey, that's it, good enough, you know. <laughs> but it's not, that's typically not going to be good orchestration. It's going to sound keyboardistic. I'm going to know you're a MIDI pianist, composer who was using your fingers to think instead of your brain, and it's just not going to be a realistic end result. Yeah. yeah. But, I mean, that's that's the, the drawback is it takes time. If you're in a rush, yeah. you know, you want a library that you can do just the fast stuff, even... You know, if you're in a rush, you just got to get it done. Mm. You'll write, uh, ideally, you'll write in a way that still sounds good and sounds, you know, the highest quality you can, um, just in a, in a more uh, accepting style, I think. Yeah. Hey, Holly, how you doing? Holly uh, chiming in. So we got Jonathan Holly. Nice. Hello. And Michael tuning in and asking some questions and saying they're here. Very nice, very nice. Yeah. Now, Kyle, I think you had uh, something you wanted to talk about. Huh? Yeah, I was saying about just like just certain uh, microphone types. I think it's something we kind of, especially nowadays in this world of MIDI and sample libraries, we kind of take for granted. Uh, I don't want to get too too far into it, but just kind of just kind of give you a certain idea of just the different microphone types and their polar patterns. I mentioned polar patterns pretty much. It's the what their what the microphone's pattern will pick up sound wise. Do microphones go into hibernation? Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's the polar pattern, the polar and there's pattern. the grizzly pattern, and the brown pattern. What is this polar pattern? The microphone. What is this polar pattern? The grizzly pattern. I know there's the Yeti. Oh. The Yeti. <laughs> now, we haven't found that pattern yet. Uh, <laughs> some skeptical. Yeah, the, the best so. microphone is a Sasquatch, but no one's ever seen it. <laughs> but fact, that is the Yeti microphone right there. But, uh, <laughs> That's true, Yeti Pro. But seriously, folks, <laughs> uh, uh, tell us more about these polar patterns. Yes. Just to kind of go into it, I mean, first and starting off, though, is just understanding different microphones types, not the polar pattern, but the type itself. So you'll have a condenser microphone, which is probably the most popular type of microphone. Uh, really good examples would be, say, the very famous Neumann U87, uh, the Audio-Technica 4041, which is a more of a pencil-style condenser microphone. Uh, then you would go from there, you'd have the dynamic microphone, which example would be very popular, everyone kind of knows it, even if you're really not into recording, the, uh, the SM57, SM58 uh, dynamic microphones obviously are they're called that for a reason. They're used for multiple sound sources. You can use it on a snare drum, you can use it on a guitar amp, you can use it on even strings if you kind of desire. It may not give you the best quality sound, but they're, they're just very reliable in that sort of uh, regard. Uh, from there, you have ribbon microphones, which are uh, extremely clean and detailed and accurate, but they, unfortunately, they really, in most cases, they can't take extreme sound sources. So you'll have a chance of destroying that ribbon microphone, you know, the actual ribbon inside the microphone. And they have ribbon microphones nowadays that don't use it, or they use a very strong, you know, much more stronger material, so you don't have too much of a a problem of running into like an overloading, you know, uh -huh. destroying your mic. So the ribbon um, itself is made out of a material that is uh, fragile. Right, exactly. It's it's, it's, it's extremely so fragile. So subject definitely to maybe 130 dB. Yes, yeah, exactly. Um, oh, okay. So yeah. you don't want to, yeah, you don't turn on fan across the ribbon. You're going to destroy it. It's mm -hmm. yeah. you're feeding, uh, yeah, you're feeding way too much uh, signal into it. Uh, uh, but what would be the benefit, though, of going a ribbon? Oh, it, it just the, the the detailed sound, the accuracy. They're very popular with with strings. They're very popular with you know even jazz groups, yeah. uh, brass. It just it just picks up just a beautiful sound. Yeah, it's, it has this sound that's like between, um, I don't know. It's it's analog, and transistor. Yes, yeah. And electric, kind of all combined. It's a it's a gorgeous tone. It's like it's it it's made for just that that sweet spot that we love. If you are using it on something that's a little more of a high amplitude source, like mm -hmm. a guitar amp or something, usually people will pair them. So they'll have a dynamic microphone or a condenser right up to the amp, and then they'll in the, kind of from the background a little bit, you know, maybe three to five feet back, they'll have the actual ribbon microphone. That makes sense. Yeah, rib the ribbon gives you the color, and the condenser is yeah. a little more shrill. Exactly, exactly. You're getting mm -hmm. more Take of a that bite, you know, from the actual microphone. You're getting that that really. You know, kind of almost blown out sound in its own right, and then you're exactly you're pairing it with that more detailed, sort of clean, airy tone. Um, very popular. They're also very popular just for uh, obviously voiceovers, vocal work. Uh, depending on what you're doing, obviously you don't want to use like a metal singer, somebody who does like extreme vocals with a <laughs> that might you know you might destroy the mic, um, <laughs> or just have a really you know uh, 
high uh, compression ratio on there. You know, something that people uh, may not be aware of um, is you can mic a source with mul with more mics than you'll even use. Oh, and, yeah. and the reason why you would do that, you know, and this is just sort of like now the logistics of being an audio engineer, you know, or a recording engineer. So you have options, you know. Maybe one mic might sound better with an EQ uh, than the other one. You know, you might be able to match it and get it's more clear, or one just might give a better tone, or you know, be amplifying the the sibilance uh, less uh, and the transients better, or uh, you know, there you know. So what I'm trying to say is for the listeners is that uh, you don't have to ch necessarily always choose a mic for an instrument. You can mic the instrument with multiple mics, mm -hmm. yep. record them all. And then choose the best later because you know when the musician's performing, that's you know expensive time. And if you've got the mics there, plug them in, record a lot of different sources, and then worry about you know um, that sort of like those producer nuances later. Right. Exactly. There, there, there's even points where you can combine uh, different microphones with different polar patterns to create uh, actual producer style effects in the studio, just using right. microphones, just mid size, mid size MS, cardio, exactly, uh, cardio and to figure eight together. Uh, and it just just the way the polar patterns cancel out certain frequencies and certain sound sources, the way the actual like figure eight is pretty much synonymous with a ribbon microphone. And figure eight polar pattern is just what it sounds like. You have it picks up sound from the front, cancels everything from the side, and then it comes right back to the actual behind the microphone. So this is okay, once again, if you're recording a live, say a live jazz jazz group or whatever whatever you are, a live group in general in your studio. And the way their placement is, so you have, okay, you guys are going to be in the back, you'll be in the front, so we'll pick up each sound source. I don't want anybody standing on the side, so this way it's going to cancel out the sound anyway, so it's not going to come through properly. But it always depends. It just depends on the, what you want sound-wise, if you want a unique kind of effect, or you, you, pick, you find something you like. I think it's just, that's the beautiful thing of audio. If it sounds good, and if it's technically not right or weird, it doesn't matter. It sounds good. It's, you know. Yeah. Right. Um, but but yeah, I mean, but going after that, I mean, after Ruben is gonna have two microphones, which I mean, you don't really see. T I mean, you do nowadays. They're not as prevalent. Uh, usually, these will come with their own uh, actual power source, so they'll come with like their own adapter. It's a big own, old tube. <laughs> exactly, just a big old tube. Which is, it looks like a lunchbox, and we had a couple. You know, I used a couple of those in my time, and uh, uh, like some famous, you know, Rode K two. Uh, I think the new, I think the Neumann U eighty seven was actually two microphone. Uh, as well as a condenser, it was a tube condenser. Um, another Neumann M one forty seven popular uh, tube microphone, um, and these were basically just they used the tube to boost the actual signal the microphone to pick up, so you wouldn't have to just rely on say a preamp for it or phantom power. It just had its own power source, uh, which could be useful in a lot of different regards. Uh, but going off that and going more into polar pattern types uh, with each of those microphones, like I said, you do have different types of polar patterns that go alongside it. Um, so you know. Cardioid, uh, super cardioid, hyper cardioid, uh, omni. Uh, you have figure eight, which I just kind of briefly went over there for a little bit. Um, but uh, and it's really it, it helps to have more of like an actual graph to kind of see these. I can't, I don't like doing those right. <laughs> to kind of show you, but in the same regard. Um, but like an infinity symbol. Yeah, it would be yeah. Like figure eight. It would be like well, it would be a kind of like almost or like a more like an omni because it just covers all your. Yeah. your Those sound are effect. like three dimensional shapes right. around it's, the microphone. Exactly. Yeah. So mm. you, you 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 pull up those on Google it's search, you're going to see exactly like say a. It's called cardioid. a pickup pattern. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, cardioid. It kind of looks like a like a mushroom, in in its own right. You yeah. Know? And then you have super cardioid where it picks up some from the back, so you want a little bit of that sound. Mm. And then hypercardioid is much bigger, so it almost. Kind of almost like a like a figure eight in its own right, but it's a much smaller pickup from the back of it. Yeah. Um, we just kind of go with Omni is obviously all directional microphones, so say you you know want to pick up just a three hundred and sixty degree source, you know. Yeah. Um, and just understanding, like I said, just the uses of these uh, different different types of applications. I don't want to go too crazy into it because you can go off about it for hours. Um, yeah, all right. Very very intense, but in the same regard, um, like I said, dy dynamic microphones. Very useful for amplified instruments. Very useful for really you can technically use them for anything. Vocals uh, yeah. it depends on one of the track. good things that you can use dynamic microphones for is see uh, you put electricity through condenser microphones. You don't put electricity through dynamic microphones. Hmm. Um, basically, um, you can think of dynamic microphones as sort of like the old Thomas Edison telephones. You know, where you have like a magnet and, it, and it, with a diaphragm and then that. When the diaphragm moves, 
it creates a, some variation in the uh, sort of electrical um, sequence of electrons that are on the in the copper cable, and so that creates the wave that we hear on the other end. But all of the uh, signal is created from physical movement and am and the amplification of the object itself. Um, and, and because of that, it, it can't really listen very far away. It has a steep drop off. It's like you got to be kind of close to it. That's why it's good for like vocalists, you know, but also for isolation. If you want to isolate an instrument, and that's why it's one of the reasons why like the Sennheiser 421 is a great mic for drums because it has just one of the best diaphragms. But it's a con it's a dynamic mic that you can put on your toms and your different drums, but it gets it extremely isolated you know because the drop off is like a few inches by a foot and a half you know you're talking about 40 db exactly. of differential you know but when you start to pump electricity into that type of a system it can start to hear stuff that's way far off in the distance and it kind of levels off that drop off effect so that's one of the nice uh, ways to use dynamic mic that's one of the reasons why you might choose to use dynamic mics is if you know that you want an instrument isolated, but you got to remember that you got to put those kinds of mics kind of like right, like within an inch or two or right. three of the instrument. Otherwise, I mean, you can put it farther, but you're going to be pumping up the entire room at that point because the drop off already happened. The distance drop off. You're going to start increasing. When that. you talk on a telephone, you don't talk from like far away. You know? Right, right. You're going to start increasing that noise to signal ratio, and you're going to have to start turning up the actual volume when you're trying to say mix or so. You're trying to listen back to, it and you're going to start getting that that noise that kind of it just, just just kind of a common occurrence with that type of thing so yes but yeah it always depends um always depends always depends on kind of what the application is like i said before i mean it really just kind of you know what you're looking for sound wise i will say the md421 if you do go for that microphone invest in a thing of tape gaffer's tape whatever it is because the clip on that microphone <laughs> slippery you will knock it off every time yeah it's such an easy it's like it's just the way it fits the button right at the bottom of it it's 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 Pretty much in this spot, your hand just naturally goes to when you grab it, and constantly falling from the actual clip, and you're just like, "Ooh!" Like, and they've never really. I remember when uh, that design. I don't know why. Like they're just like. Oh. I remember when Brian Tyler posted. I guess he was doing. He was videoing himself doing some drums, just the uh, improvisation. And uh, during one of his fills, bam! He just accidentally like, slammed right his, his 421, and uh, and had to go to the shop to get repaired. Oh, it was geez. that bad. Oh, <laughs> I was say, uh, the upside of those normally, I guess, unless you're uh, Brian Kelly, unless you're, <laughs> but it, it, they're pretty strong. They're kind of in that same, almost in that same uh, category as like an SM57, where I've seen videos where guys will literally just take it and drop it from a building. Oh, man. Oh. Smack, they go down, they into a giant dent in the actual Damn. grill, and then they go, like, oh, it works just fine. Do like, they have I, like a does it blend uh, <laughs> microphone? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's a YouTube it's channel. Like, you know, it like, it's, it's interesting to see how some of these are just like their actual total workhorses, and you can literally throw them against the wall, and they'll, they'll, they'll bounce right back from it. But yeah. It's just interesting to see. But Well, thanks everybody for tuning in. Um, remember that if you're interested in learning more about film composing, this summer we have the Total Scoring Mastery Seminar. Go to the website search it on Google we have the links down below and uh, you can learn a lot more about that if that's going to be a good fit for you send us a message if you'd like to talk some more well thanks everybody yeah, I think right. I had a great show today yeah we did that's see awesome. you later everyone see you